Shalom and welcome everyone to the ICEJ webinar series. I'm David Parsons, one of the vice presidents and senior spokesmen for the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. We're coming to you again from our headquarters in the capital of Israel. And uh, we're at uh, six months, basically. We've passed the six month mark since uh, uh, the war in Gaza uh, was triggered by Hamas on October 7. And we felt this was a good time to do sort of a recap, uh, a review of the war. And uh, we, uh, it, it's a war that doesn't have a name yet. Um, sometimes uh, you can't name a war until after, it, after it's over. And uh, if it were to end today, I think a good name for it would be the Six Month War. And that's in juxtaposition to the Six Day War, which was this uh, lightning quick and very decisive victory of Israel over its enemies, whereas this Six Month War, uh, it already implies that it's a longer conflict it's been uh, very complex, and at this uh, time, uh, it's still uh, undecided, and uh, it can go uh, in any way. It can actually escalate. It could uh, um, a law in the fighting right now could get extended. So we'll have to see where it goes. But we want to uh, say take a. Um, uh, an assessment today of uh, how it started, where we are, and where it's get, uh, going. And we want to answer, uh, try to answer these questions today. How was Israel so surprised, especially when they had just marked uh, the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, when they were surprised on a high Jewish holiday, uh, just like on Simhat Torah on Yom Kippur in 1973. In fact, the anniversary of that was on October 6th, and here it fell almost to the day, October 7th. 50 years later, you're already marking how you got shocked and surprised one time, and how did it happen on the 50th anniversary of that? Why uh, has Hezbollah not joined the war in full force? Of course, there's a uh, uh, artillery duel along the border, but they have not uh, really gone into uh, total battle mode against Israel with all the uh, weapons and, and rocket arsenal they have. How has Israel done in Gaza so far? If the fighting is mainly contained there, how have they done against Hamas? We're going to uh, try to look at where are things now and where they're currently heading. And finally, I think this is a, an important question. You can ask it at any stage, but here at six months of this fighting, if the war were in today, who would be the winner? Who could claim victory? So we're going to try and uh, uh, center all our remarks around these questions and try and, and look back. What's happened? Where are we? Where are we heading? And who would be declared the winner? Now, there will be uh, a commission of inquiry. There's going to be all sorts of studies and books and everything that will come out in the future about how Israel got so surprised on October 7th. And it was a, not only a surprise, but a shock to this nation. Uh, we live, I live here, uh, all of us at the Christian Embassy on staff here. And I tell you, we, we were totally shocked by this ourselves. Uh, and those inquiries are coming, but we already know enough to really assess that uh, the Israeli leadership, whether it's political or whether it was the military leadership, they were guilty of what we call groupthink, that there develops a consensus about the enemy and what they're doing and what their intentions and their abilities and such, and everyone buys into that groupthink and even though the IDF itself, the Israeli military, and their intelligence uh, divisions, they have ombudsmen. They've actually set in place, and it was done after Yom Kippur, after that great intelligence failure, where they had groupthink that Egypt and Syria would not attack. Uh, they uh, um, instituted these reviews and, and like devil's advocate to go in and challenge 
what the groupthink is, what the consensus is, and that was happening uh, all the time over recent months before October 7, challenging that consensus, uh, which said that Hamas was deterred by Israel, that Israel had been so effective in countering the, ta the terror tunnels in um, uh, the Iron Dome, uh, taking away a lot of the sting of the Hamas rockets, the, the damage they were doing, uh, so many uh, ways that, and with the building boom in Gaza, uh, the thinking was that Hamas was deterred from attacking Israel, that they were too busy governing Gaza as if they really enjoyed it. We've heard since Hamas spokesmen saying, we don't care about the people of Gaza. We only care about destroying of Israel. Let the UN, let the world take care of the people of Gaza. They've said it with their own mouth. But this was part of the mistaken thinking by Israeli military and political leaders. And uh, they ignored the warning signs. There were studies, there were people warning that Hamas, uh, even though Israel had stopped the terror tunnels, had stopped uh, a lot of the rockets, there were still warning signs and indications that they were preparing for a big attack. And I think uh, the, the worst instance of this is uh, the female soldiers in some of the observation rooms looking at all the camera banks in front of them down along the Gaza border that they were warning, we see signs over there, we see activities of, uh, soldier, of, of armed fighters coming closer to the, to the border, that there's um, uh, uh, vehicles and, and rockets and everything, that everything's moving close to the border. And these female soldiers who were watching their screens, seeing all this, were dismissed, even threatened with court-martial by some of their commanders over them. And even the, the, the night before, as these warnings came in, the head of the Gaza division and his deputy were on the phone with each other about three in the morning, on the morning of uh, October 7, and they said, um, uh, you know, there does seem to be some strange movements. Maybe they're going to attack one or two settlements, but let's get a little sleep and we'll talk about it at seven or eight in the morning. And of course, the war starts with huge rocket barrages at 6.30 in the morning, the breach of the border uh, fence in about 80 places. I think most assessments will say that. Uh, and, and Hamas, around 3,000 Hamas terrorists and some other odd civilians came across, attacked 25 Israeli communities, and uh, I think eight army bases, including the, the Gaza Division headquarters near Raim, even near the Nova Music Festival. Uh, the, the Gaza Division headquarters were just about a mile or so from that music festival. Those people should have been safe, but even that base was overrun by uh, Hamas. And uh, I think on the Israeli side, part of what uh, caused them to let down their guard on that day that Israel had spent almost a year in this very heated and exhausting uh, political debate over judicial reforms in the country. And both sides had played brinksmanship and it got to where the people were exhausted. The Knesset was on recess for the fall high holiday break. Everyone was taking a break, the protesters, everyone the, the whole debate was going to start back up on Sunday, October 8th. Protests were already uh, being planned. And uh, it, so it's sort of the last day of rest. It's a Shabbat. It's a high Shabbat, a high holy day, Simhat Torah, the end of the eight days of Sukkot and the end of the two-week period of the high holidays from Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. It's that last holiday. You're going to get one more morning of rest before Israel goes back to this debate. So I think even the military had let down its guard uh, on that day, on that morning, and somehow Hamas timed it uh, in their, in their um, sense perfectly. And we also have to admit that whatever mistakes uh, Israel made in assessing whether Hamas was deterred or not, 
that Hamas itself fed into Israel's wrong thinking, that they were successful, it's sad to say, in deceiving Israel in several regards. First of all, they held the, the attack as a closely guarded secret. There was training. There were certain commanders and officers who knew their role, knew what they were doing, but they kept the overall plan very tightly, as a t tightly held secret among only five or so commanders. Uh, we also saw how Hamas, for years, they've been inciting uh, over the Temple Mount, over the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, the Haram al-Sharif, as they call it, in Jerusalem, uh, for especially at Passover in the spring and at, at Sukkot Tabernacles in the fall, a lot of incitement and rioting, stone throwing down at the Western Wall and all. And that had sort of disappeared. For years, they had sent civilians to the fence to agitate in what they called the March of Return. It started in 2018 at Israel's, uh, what, uh, what is that, 70th uh, um, birthday. Uh, they wanted the March of Return, the refugees coming home. Well, those marches had disappeared. There weren't even very many fire balloons over this summer from uh, Hamas in Gaza. And I think one of the real deceptions uh, that really uh, caught Israel off guard was that Palestinian Islamic Jihad, a rival terror militia, Islamic militia in Gaza, started a, a three-day rocket war, intense rocket war with Israel last May. And uh, the, the Hamas decided not to join it. And that sort of fed into Israel's thinking that they're not interested in a fight right now. They're more busy governing and trying to control Gaza and uh, enjoy the building boom and all the money um, that was coming in. So that was part of their deception. Iran had also increased its recruit, recruiting and smuggling of, of weapons, recruiting terrorists in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank among the Palestinians there. Uh, they were putting, sending in more weapons, more money, and uh, this caused the IDF to send some of its forces along the Gaza border up into the uh, communities, the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria and the West Bank, and even some of the right-wing members of the Israeli government, uh, Shmotrik, Ben Gavir, had demanded this, and that this meant that on October 7th, there were a lot fewer Israeli troops down here along the border with Gaza. So that's another element of successful uh, deception. I, I find it quite interesting, um, if I can take our map here and uh, roll in some, and we can see right here their, the march of return, they would send people from Gaza City, from Khan Yunus, up to the border area here. Uh, a lot of civilians, they, you even had it on the border with Lebanon, on the Golan, a lot of civilians as if they wanted to break through the, the security fence. This went on for several years from 2018 forward for a few years. They stopped. But in the days uh, over Sukkot, right before October 7, you had little groups of 20, 30, you know, it was usually women and children approaching the border, and there were a few men with them, and as they look back at the footage of this now, they didn't think much of it, Israel didn't think it was much of a threat, but now they see that the men were getting down and hiding explosives right near the fence that they were used on the morning of October 7th to blow up the fence. So there were these little threats of, of reviving the March of Return and some little mini marches there, but it was all part of the tactic of, of deceiving and getting explosives hidden there. And so we regrettably have to say that the Al-Aqsa storm, as Hamas called it, their operation that was launched on October 7, was uh, even more successful than they anticipated. And many have said, you know, they got lucky. They killed, uh, the final assessment is over 1,200 Israelis and some foreign workers. 
uh, they took two, over 260 people hostage back into Gaza. And uh, really, the, the real success is that, that uh, all, of, all of Israel was afraid of uh, rocket barrages, not only from, from Gaza, uh, but from Lebanon in the north, and, and also home invasions, even in Jerusalem and the territories all over Israel. Who, the question was, who's going to join in this and invade our homes and kill and rape and pillage and behead people like all the images you saw coming out of the Gaza border area? It was a real fear here, and uh, um, the, the, especially up on the communities on the northern border, because Hezbollah had its own, has its own Radwan force, which had been training to do the very same thing. They were experienced with fighting in Lebanon, uh, excuse me, in the Syrian civil war. They're better armed, they're better trained. They weren't going to hang around uh, while they're raping and killing and pillaging and sort of get gleeful and take their time at it. They're trained to kill and move on. So Hamas uh, sort of dallied and enjoyed the evil and the atrocities they were committing. The Rodwan force would have done a lot more damage if they had been coming over at the same time. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Israelis were afraid of this, but the rockets from Hezbollah did not come. They did not uh, cross the border. And I, 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 we can actually uh, say that as bad as it was, as successful and as lucky as Hamas got, it could have been even much, much worse. And we have to really thank the Lord in those first hours and days, many Christians praying, and, uh, and uh, Hezbollah did not join the war, and we have to thank the Lord for it. Uh, and why? But why did they, they not join it? Well, the Hamas uh, secrecy uh, hurt them as well. It, it, you know, they were able to surprise Israel, uh, but um, they kept the, such a tight secret what were they were going to do on October 7 that Iran really didn't know what they were doing, and Hezbollah didn't. Now, Hamas and Hezbollah had been coordinating with Iran, with the Houthis in Yemen, with other uh, terror militias aligned with Iran in what they called the United Front of Resistance. And a year ago at Passover in early April uh, last year, there was a terror attack that killed the, uh, the D, the mother and two daughters from the D family down in the Jordan Valley. There were uh, uh, 20 or 30 rockets fired by Hamas, not Hezbollah, by ha Hamas from Lebanon, from Tyre and Lebanon, on Shlomi, right here near the border. And uh, Leb uh, the Iranians, Hamas, Hezbollah, everyone was saying the whole front is united now, we're coordinating, we're going to attack Israel all together. This will be the first time in all these years where Israel has to face rockets from the north and the south. They were warning about it. And I do think uh, that Hamas and Hezbollah were planning something big with Iran of a simultaneous attack, but I don't think there are some reports that they had set a date. I don't think they had set a date. I don't think they had gotten that far, but what did happen is Hamas jumped the gun. They got out too early ahead uh, of Iran and Hezbollah, so not only Israel got surprised by the October 7 attack, but Hezbollah did as well. And we have to uh, look at, at uh, put ourselves in Hezbollah's position on October 7. What do they do? They see Hamas having some success. They're not quite prepared. Uh, they weren't, this caught them by surprise. What do they do? Well, they started watching for a day or so what's going to happen. How much success is Hamas going to have? Israel very quickly started pushing back against Hamas. They didn't reach the, uh, the big air base, uh, 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 Hatsarim air base near Beersheba. They didn't reach a prison they wanted to get to near Ashkelon to set uh, free a bunch of Palestinian prisoners. They thought the whole, uh, bed, all the Bedouin Arabs in the Negev, 
that they might even reach Hebron here in the West Bank in Judea and set the whole south on fire and then Hezbollah should join and all. Well, Hamas didn't have quite that success, but Hezbollah sat back for a day or so and watched what Israel did. Israel started pushing back quickly. They, mo they did two things. They mobilized over 350,000 reservist soldiers. They called up around 300,000. Over 350, 60,000 came and reported for duty, even those who weren't called up. And, uh, this, and they quickly deployed uh, additional forces on the north that deterred Hezbollah from attacking quickly. And the second thing they did, Israel, uh, within two or three, four days, they evacuated all the uh, small towns and villages, plus Kiryat Shemona, 20, 30,000 people, uh, within uh, five to seven kilometers, five miles or so of the border, about 120,000 civilians were pulled out so that uh, Hezbollah and especially its elite Radwan forces, which had been trained to come over, capture towns, capture villages, kill, take hostages, the very things Hamas did here on October 7th, they had been training, this is what they wanted to do, uh, uh, Hamas stole from their game plan, and now that these villages uh, in Israel were evacuated, it really took out a lot of the incentive and the ability of, of the Ranwan forces to come and inflict damage right along the border. So that uh, between the, the call-up of reservists and the evacuation of uh, the Israeli civilians from the border area within a couple days, this deterred Hezbollah from joining full force into the war. And Hezbollah's sense has been content to contribute to the war effort with Hamas by this artillery duel within five to 10 kilometers of the border. Uh, the furthest they've hit is Safad, right in this area. Uh, some um, villages, some army bases. There's been maybe, uh, I think, around 10 soldiers and, and six or eight civilians, Israelis killed up there, but there's been a, uh, almost three, over 300, most of them Hezbollah, but other militiamen and, and some civilians killed in Lebanon. A lot, uh, Israel's destroyed a lot of uh, uh, Hezbollah's rockets and, and uh, positions there in South Lebanon, but Hezbollah is content to uh, uh, engage in an artillery duel right along the border that pins certain number of Israeli forces up here so they can't fight this war in Gaza or help in the West Bank, and that's, they feel, is their contribution so far. This was a very critical decision that the war would be very, very different if, if Hezbollah had joined at full force from the start. Uh, they have between 150 and estimates up to 300,000 rockets, mortars, missiles, many of them guided, many of them much heavier payloads than what Hamas has in Gaza. They could saturate and reach all the way down to Demona. They've threatened even the nuclear facility in Demona down here in the Negev Desert. And so it was a very uh, uh, critical turning point uh, and continuing uh, um, uh, aspect of this war that Hezbollah, probably with Iranian assent, has not joined. They don't want to get into a full war with Israel right now and lose the, the, uh, the, that tentacle, that uh, proxy militia of Hezbollah that uh, Iran has built up in Lebanon. And uh, uh, Israel still has the initiative, if they want to go in and take down Hezbollah in Lebanon, we don't know whether this will happen. There is talk of, say, in May or June uh, that this would happen. But uh, Lebanon is a sort of a different question than, than Gaza, two million people here. But Lebanon has a lot more uh, allies in the Arab Sunni, Sunni Arab world, especially Saudi Arabia, that they're not going to really like Israel attacking a, a sovereign country like Lebanon, even with uh, Hezbollah. I think a lot of these Sunni Arab nations would be glad if Israel defeated Hezbollah, but it will also mean a lot of damage and destruction and death in Lebanon 
And that's going to be a very critical decision whether they decide to do that. We now want to turn to the question. This is, you know, how did it start? How was Israel so surprised? And uh, why didn't Hezbollah join? Now we want to say, how has Israel done so far in this war? Well, what they did, if I can get my mouse over here and uh, pull up the map a little more, grab it, okay. Um, traditionally, when Israel has to go deal with terror threats in Gaza over the decades, they would divide Gaza into thirds. They would come right about here near um, the, the Nahal Oz uh, crossing and go straight across to the sea, divide the north off Gaza City. They'd come down here near um, the Kisufim crossing and come right across here. So you had a north center and south of Gaza, which made it easier to uh, separate the three and deal with each one, uh, one at a time. And that's exactly what they've done with the ground operation after a couple weeks of air campaign. I believe it was uh, the, the war started on October 20, uh, on October 7, on October 27, three weeks in, Israel uh, launched the ground operations. There were a few little incursions before then, but the major one was then. They first went in, separated out Gaza City, dealt with Gaza City, Beit Hanun, all Shifa Hospital, all the hospitals, we all remember that. Then they went into central Gaza and have been dealing with the terror threats there and the tunnels. And then the last uh, two, three months, they've been down here in Khan Yunus, which is really the heart of, of Hamas. It's where it was conceived, where it takes its inspiration, where it's training schools, for, and especially ideologically and training of Hamas leaders. They're all from there. All the main Hamas leaders are from Khan Yunus. And uh, so they're dealing with that. The main thing that remains, there's two Hamas battalions here in central Gaza, and they believe four left uh, uh, here in the Rafah area near the border. And we'll talk a little more um, about this. But so far, Israel has killed or wounded about two-thirds of the Hamas fighters. They say out of 24, uh, I think, battalions, they've destroyed 18. Uh, so there's six more left, two here, four down in Rafah. Uh, some of the others may have some fighters left. So they've killed around two-thirds of the Hamas fighters. Uh, Israel's uh, uh, killed or wounded. Uh, Israel says they've killed over 13,000 Hamas and Islamic Jihad militiamen in Gaza since the ground operation started in, in uh, October. Uh, but... Um, and a thousand or more uh, that were uh, that had come into Israel on October 7, 8, 9. It took two or three days to push them back. They killed over a thousand here. One uh, local regional security chief told me it's at least 1,600 Hamas fighters that were killed uh, in those two or three days. So you're talking uh, between 14 and 15,000 Hamas militiamen killed, plus more wounded and taken out of the battle, won't be able to fight again. Uh, and uh, in comparison, the IDF lo has lost a little over 260 troops in the Gaza ground operations. So, you know, you don't want to lose anyone, but the ratio is way out of proportion uh, to each other. The IDF has done well. They've destroyed hundreds of miles of terror tunnels, found there's even more than they expected. Uh, they've exposed and destroyed them, but there's some question whether they've even gotten to half. The IDF insists that they've uh, done the main strategic tunnels. They've taken care of them. Uh, some of these are smuggling tunnels along the border, other reasons that people have dug these tunnels, but it's still a lot of terror tunnels left. But there's been some uh, problem areas that have impeded Israel's progress first. You've got uh, 2.3 million civilians in Gaza, and they were left on the battlefield at the insistence of the world, and they've been used by Hamas as human shields when you combine all those civilians right in an urban uh, fighting setting and all the terror tunnels. It's been a real challenge for the IDF. 
uh, but the IDF has actually done very, very well compared to other uh, urban battle scenarios of recent decades in this sort of asymmetrical warfare with uh, terror militias. Uh, Israel is, we'd have to admit, losing in some respects the PR battle. Uh, even world leaders, uh, national leaders around the world are saying that Israel has a policy of starving the Gazans. Uh, they're getting charged at the world court in The Hague with uh, genocide. There's nations now either deciding or at least debating whether to impose arms embargoes on Israel. The UK just uh, thought about it and decided not to for now. I know it's a big uh, issue that's come up in the US and Israel really, and with our help, we need to keep fighting uh, these battles in the public arena. Uh, but I think the, the biggest challenge that Israel has faced so far is trying to get the hostages back. And sadly, half of them are still in Gaza. As many as a third of those, 130 or so, are believed there's evidence that they've, they've already, they're already dead. So you may have only about 95 to 98 of them still alive at most. And that's been, uh, you know, if we ask how is Israel doing so far, this is probably for most Israelis the, in the pros and con ledgers, this is the worst thing uh, so far. But I think two major decisions have hampered Israel in this fighting in Gaza. Number one was when the world insisted that all the civilians in Gaza stay in on the battlefield, as Israel said, were coming in. They insisted that they would not leave because the Palestinians said this is too much like the Nakba in 1948, when all the Palestinians fled and were never able to return to their homes. Israel's trying to ethnically cleanse the Gaza Strip. If they leave, they won't let them back in. And I don't think that was Israel's intent at all, but the, it was the world's decision that Israel had to leave them there. That was to Hamas's advantage. They wanted to use them as uh, human shields, but this was unprecedented. And I don't think you can find any other battlefield, any other war or battle of uh, a similar kind in all of world history where the world, all the world, the whole international community insisted that innocent civilians must remain on the battlefield. And that uh, is, is a sad state of affairs for the world to force the Gazan civilians to stay there because even polls for years have showed that 60% of them want to leave. And believe me, many wanted to voluntarily leave before this war and they were afraid they'd never come back on their own. And the second problem is that neither the UN Security Council nor the General Assembly of the United Nations. To this day, neither body has condemned the atrocities committed by Hamas on October 7th. The, the, not one resolution. Of course, they've tried, the US and others have tried to get a resolution passed, always vetoed by Russia, China, probably not even enough votes to get to a, a, a veto power. And this is, is unpardonable, I believe, that it sends such a message to Israel that your blood is, Jewish blood is cheap. We don't care about it. We don't care if uh, Israeli women, if Jewish women are raped, if their babies are beheaded, that uh, it's fine and it's all right. And it sent a message to Israel, the world really doesn't care about you. You better defend yourself. I think Israel would have been more receptive to other things that the world said and demanded if the world had at least acknowledged Israel's pains and wounds and the shame and degradation that Hamas posed, all the atrocities, if they had condemned them, I think it would have made a difference in this world. And I think it's an, uh, an uh, unpardonable moment for uh, an indictment on the world that to this day, uh, Hamas has never been condemned for what they did on October 7th. So now that I've got that uh, off my chest, 
I, I just think it's important to the way the, world, the war has been prosecuted since then that Israel says the world doesn't care about us. We just have to protect ourselves. And it closes your ears to what the world is saying, any advice, any criticism. If you don't say you care about Israeli lives, then I don't blame Israel for not listening to you. I hope, I hope the world hears that. Where are things uh, now and where are they heading as we try and start wrapping up here? Uh, well, there's these tensions with the U.S., the Biden administration, with political overtones. There's a, it's a ele presidential election she season. Joe Biden's trying to get reelected. But these tensions between Israel and the U.S. over Israel's war policies in Gaza. And, uh, but we can still say that American weapons are still coming. They're still uh, on track to give uh, Israel more military aid and support through Congress. Um, Israel did change its strategy recently, primarily because of the, uh, the tragedy with the world central kitchen aid workers, the seven of them who were killed uh, by Israeli rockets uh, about 10 days ago, that since then Israel has changed uh, its strategy, I think mainly in order to get a hostage deal to create the elements that improve the conditions for a, a hostage deal. Number one, they're flooding Gaza with more aid uh, through the Ashdod port, through new openings in the north, through the, the old uh, uh, openings in the south, in all the areas, trying to get more aid um, into, uh, into Gaza. They're, they were drawn, Israel has drawn most of its forces. They've just kept this one area uh, where they uh, have a security corridor all the way out to the sea. It's near the Beeri Forest. It's right near the Christian Embassy's new nature park, uh, the new corridor, the main military security corridor that divides Gaza in half, uh, runs there. Otherwise, they brought out most of their forces. They're doing pinpoint operations. They just took out three sons of Hamas leader uh, Ismail Haniyeh. Uh, and, uh, but I think they withdrew them because Hamas was hiding and was only coming out to do ambushes, but Hamas right now wants to preserve its forces. They're hiding them because they want to try and get a ceasefire and then retake control of the Gaza Strip. And Israel itself wants to create the conditions for a hostage deal. I think they're starting to give more priority to that because the people of Israel are demanding it. And currently we have this lull in fighting, waiting for either a hostage deal to get concluded and start uh, working its way out, or, uh, or a, a, an operation into Rafah right here along the border. Uh, and even with all the bad things that have happened, all the criticism of Israel and everything, I, I find it, if you look at where things are right now, we just have reports that the government of Indonesia which is the country with the world's largest Muslim population, um, around 140 million Muslims or more, that uh, they want to normalize relations with Israel. They're doing it now, even during the war, in order, of course, to get uh, into the uh, World Economic Club. But uh, there's a government there uh, that's just been voted in that's more receptive to relations with Israel. I find this remarkable that that uh, it's a good sign that things can quickly turn back to the good for Israel. But I would say that, that in the aftermath of this war, whenever it ends and, and it's already started, but Israel will be fighting against lawfare, warfare against Israel through legal means because of this war. It's, this battle is gonna be with us for a long, long time. And the question that we ultimately come to, if the war were in, to end today, who would be the winner? Who could declare victory? And of course, Hamas is going to claim victory. The, the supreme leader of, uh, of Iran also said the other day, we need a ceasefire. He was in support of it because uh, Hamas has run this, won this war and we, we need to now get a ceasefire. And uh, they uh, claim victory because it's sort of uh, in the Arab culture in the region, 
that if you survive a battle, even if you just survived to fight another day, you claim victory. I remind you that uh, after uh, the, the surprise attack of the Yom Kippur War 1973, just over 50 years ago now, that uh, Israel turned the tide and humiliated the Syrian and Egyptian armies and they crossed the Suez Canal and were headed for Cairo with no military, no Egyptian army between them and Cairo. And Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, uh, who just passed away, he came and saved the day at kilometer 101 uh, and, and, uh, and bailed the Egyptians out. But even though the Egyptians got, got their butts kicked in that war by Israel at, by the end of it, uh, Egypt still erected a monument to the victory in the Yom Kippur War in Cairo. And this is where uh, um, Anwar Sadat was assassinated after making peace with Israel by an Iranian-backed uh, 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 terrorist. And he was killed watching a, uh, a, 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 a military parade celebrating that victory in front of the monument. So even in Cairo, there's a monument to Egypt's victory in the 73 war. So, you know, Hamas may claim victory, but when you look at it, there, you know, by their account, there's over 33,000 dead in Gaza. That's a tragedy. We don't know the exact number, but there's been a lot of innocent civilians killed mainly because of Hamas's tactics of using them as human shields and deciding to use Gaza and all the civilians stuck in Gaza as the battlefield. Much, many parts of Gaza are in shambles. The Gazan people are shell-shocked. They, we have to admit, they have suffered during this war. I'd rather be on this side of the battle line than on that side over the past six months. Even as traumatic as it has been for on the Israeli side, it's much more so there. Uh, so however Hamas declares victory, believe me, I don't think the people of Gaza feel so victorious right now. Hamas will try to uh, reassert control in Gaza. Israel needs to prevent that. It, uh, Hamas leaders, at least their leaders, need to be exiled not only from Gaza, either they're killed or they're exiled from Gaza and Qatar. I think that's very important uh, in, for Israel to come out a winner in this um, battle. Now, Israel, I believe, can claim a partial victory if the war were to end today. The country recovered quickly uh, from the whole shock of uh, October 7. The IDF has done amazingly well from a military standard uh, perspective in an urban warfare setting in Gaza. Probably, you know, the U.S. did it in Mosul against terrorists who had a couple months to dig a few tunnels in an urban area. And uh, there were m much fewer fighters, only around 5,000. Israel has faced around 40,000. All these uh, millions of civilians around. And yet Israel has done much better in uh, protecting the lives of civilians, even on the uh, the Gazan side, this whole notion that they're deliberately uh, committing suicide is a lie and a blood libel because if Israel has killed around 15,000 uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad combatants and the death toll, according to Hamas, is around 33,000, you have almost a one-to-one -one ratio of combatant deaths to civilian deaths which in, you look at any instance of urban warfare over recent decades, even NATO forces, US-led forces in Afghanistan and Iraq, you're talking nine or 10 uh, civilians to every combatant dead, and the, the world average is 18 civilians killed per uh, combatant killed in most urban warfare uh, battles over recent decades, and Israel's about one-to-one -one, uh, against really challenging odds and circumstances in Gaza. So we have to defend Israel on this account. I think one of the 
you know, good things about uh, the war, if it has a good side, is that the nation has been uh, united, but it is fragile. Uh, the country wants and needs to go to new elections at some point, and they need to have less tribalism, especially uh, uh, trying to get the ultra-Orthodox out of their tribe and into the idea of trying to get the Arab uh, uh, community more integrated into society. And so far, I'd say most of the Israeli Arabs have, have uh, uh, they've decided they're not going to join what Hamas did on October 7th, and we have to really thank the Lord uh, for that. I think Israel, to, to claim victory, they have to come out of this insisting on the end or at least major reforms to UNRWA, the UN uh, agency that takes care of Palestinian refugees, feeds and educates them. Uh, and hopefully this war has uh, killed off the Palestinian claim to a right of return. What is Israeli in their right mind? What, what, how can anyone insist that people indoctrinated to hate Jews and hate Israel so much that they come across and rape women and behead children and all this, that you're going to allow them to come back and live in Israel. I think from this point on, this war, we have to make sure that it, uh, the, we say rest in peace to the claim of a right of return. Most of all, right now, Israel really, it, it's a partial victory. They cannot claim victory until they get their hostages back. We just urge everyone to keep praying for them. Uh, are they in Rafa, down here at the southern end? Uh, if they are, can they go in and, and get them before Hamas kills more of these hostages? i just say uh, very quickly that uh, the problem with Rafa down here along, it's around... Uh, nine miles, 14 kilometers, or 18 kilometers, about 12 miles here from Karen Shalom, Israel, all the way to the uh, Mediterranean along the border with Sinai and Egypt, that uh, all the refugees who left Gaza City in the center came down here, uh, about a million refugees, into a town of already about 200,000. So there's uh, about uh, 1.2 or 3 million people down here that I think they came here because they, you were closer to the food coming in through the Rafa crossing from Egypt. That's where most of the food has come in. So you're closer to the food. You want to get near it. You're living in tents. At least you got food there. Uh, but also, if this border with Egypt was ever going to be breached, you were right there and could run through the breach yourself and out in freedom and become a refugee and seek asylum somewhere, which most Gazans actually want to do. And because there's so many civilians here, the U.S. and others have said to Israel, don't go in there. Israel says we need to do it to get at the four battalion, Hamas battalions that are still there and try and uh, destroy the tunnels under the border with a lot of the weapons smuggling and try and get our hostages back. We still are going to have to see whether Israel goes uh, into Rafah or gets a, a hostage deal. Um, but we also need to start insisting that Israel, um, uh, that, that uh, other nations, we, we really need to become advocates and call for other nations like Canada, like some of these other countries that are critical of Israel and so sympathetic to the Palestinians. Well, why don't you take some of these Gazans in? You took in millions of Syrian refugees What's wrong? Are you discriminating against the Gazan refugees who voluntarily want to leave and seek a better life elsewhere? We're not talking about, you know, trying to ethnically cleanse. We're just talking about people who want a better future for themselves and let them make that decision and offer them the opportunity to come out and live a better life. We'll end uh, the presentation here. I'll take just a, a couple minutes to answer a few questions. Uh, Christine Darg, uh, she says, the media says the world would end if Netanyahu were out. Douglas Murray, who's a brilliant uh, 
Um, uh, British apologists for Israel said today this contentious, uh, contention is bewildering because any prime minister would continue same policies against an implacable enemy. What's my assessment? I agree completely, Christine, that uh, Netanyahu's policies, it's a, a, an emergency unity government with Benny Gantz and Netanyahu and Gallant and, and the, the right and center of Israel together in this war, and all the polls show most of the policies that they've adopted, especially towards Hamas and Gaza and the fighting and the war strategy and all, is within the Israeli consensus. There, but with the, uh, you know, the passage of time, some people have said we should have acted, uh, Israel should have been faster and quicker and they could already you know, have done more. Why are you pulling troops out? That's sort of a, a bone of contention, what the world wants them to do. Uh, most Israelis agree with Netanyahu that you're asking Israel to admit defeat. You're trying to rob Israel of victory. So I would say the, the vast majority of Israel have stood with the government and the overall policy. There is a large number who uh, do believe that Netanyahu should resign at some point and go to new elections. I think that's a strong consensus as well, but I don't think he should do it at this point yet because Hamas would boast and rail and say this is a victory for them. I think it has to be a decision that the Israeli may, people make in the right time. We've got a question. Which country wanted to resume established relations with Israel? Uh, it's Indonesia, which has a new government that is um, uh, more friendly towards Israel. We have to, uh, we've got some Christian pastors and evangelical leaders from Indonesia have been letting us know this, but it is a bit of a surprise to see this hitting the, uh, the headlines right now, even before the war ends. And I think, uh, you know, it shows that uh, a lot of the damage done to Israel's reputation can be easily reversed now if they can get some success in this war uh, and get it over. Uh, what avenues are there for Christians to be able to speak what God is revealing to executive leaders of Israel? Uh, look, uh, everyone has uh, the social media now, whether it's Twitter uh, or so, you know Facebook or whatever to get your messages out. Uh, everyone is bypassing the mainstream media, the legacy media, because they're all bought up by the left or here in this region, they're controlled by Qatar and Islamists and jihadists or whatever. They're inciting against Israel, but we all have the opportunity to get our messages out. I don't know if there's some other questions uh, over in the webinar chat, uh, but uh, I, because we've been presenting, it's been hard to follow. Um, uh, see if I see some real quickly. How many Palestinian civilians have died? The Western media says over 30,000. Um, and the, uh, the uh, Gazan Health Ministry, which is controlled by Hamas, now says it's over 33,000. Uh, there have been some people questioning those figures that they, you put it in a graph and it's almost like it's, it's uh, the same number added every day even though on, there's laws in fighting, there's peaks in fighting, that it seems almost like a pre-planned graft with a, a certain set trajectory that they're just adding uh, a very randomly adding a, a, almost the same number every day. And there is something I'd say very fishy about the numbers in Gaza. We may never know the exact number, but I, I would still contend that Israel, the ratio of combatants to civilians killed in Gaza is about one to one, and that refutes uh, immensely this whole thing that Israel is deliberately targeting women and children. We also have to remember that Hamas arms and trains uh, young Palestinians from age 14 upward. So when you say combatant, uh, in, uh, in relation to Hamas, you are talking from 14 years and up, and you might consider it children, but they consider them fighters and militiamen, and under military terms and military thinking, they are combatants. So there may be, you know, a lot of the uh, 14, 15,000 Hamas militiamen, 
been killed maybe under 18, but they took up arms and were on the battlefield fighting Israel, and therefore they're a legitimate military target, okay? And uh, I think we'll, um, we'll leave it uh, at this. We hope you've enjoyed uh, what we have called the six-month war in Gaza, or a view, a recap. Uh, I'm sure a lot of this most of you all understood uh, already. You knew this already, but it's good to really step back and take a look at it at this uh, marker in time and to also help us in our prayers. We need the hostages back. Lord, deliver them into freedom, even as Passover comes, this deliverance from Egypt, all the other things we need to be praying for, the dissolution of uh, UNRWA, the exile or death of all the Hamas leaders, uh, all these things that we've talked about. Please keep praying. Please keep speaking out for Israel. Use your voice in all the different ways that are available, uh, and it, it can make a difference in someone's life. And thank you. Uh, we uh, are, will wrap up this edition of the ICEJ webinar series. Join us next Thursday, 3 p.m., same time, Israel time, for our next uh, edition of the ICJ webinar. And uh, at the top of the hour, 4 o'clock, Jerusalem time, join us at the Global Prayer Gathering. Christians from all over the world joining together to pray for Israel and the region. Yes, indeed, praying for good things for the Arab people as well, because we know God loves all men, but he has a special calling over Israel for the purpose of world redemption, and we'll keep standing with this nation. We're not afraid to say God is a Zionist even in the midst of this war. God bless you from Jerusalem. Thank you for joining us for this informative webinar. Be sure to subscribe to our social media channels or visit our website at icej.org for upcoming webinars and more ICEJ exclusive content.